Hi, welcome to another edition of This Issue. My guests this time are Katie Singer from New Mexico. She's an investigative journalist and a consultant with the Electromagnetic Radiation Policy Institute. Her most recent book is Electronic Silent Spring, what many consider the most important toxics issue of our time. Also joining us is our old friend Ed Friedman from Bodenham, who's been on the show several times, who's chairman of Friends of Mary Meeting Bay. And Katie spoke at a meeting of Friends of Mary Meeting Bay last night in Brunswick. So welcome to the show, both of you. Thank you, Bruce. Glad Thanks to have us. you here. Thanks for having us. Katie, we're going to talk about the real costs, including health, climate, and financial, of these so-called digital technologies. Now, I'm not even sure what digital technologies are, so you're going to help us figure that out and learn about that. But first, could you give us some specific examples of these everyday technologies that you're concerned about and a quick introduction to the type of energy these technologies use and how it affects us as human beings? Okay. Um, I'm actually going to go back about 100 years, maybe even more. We started putting electronics into our homes with refrigerators and vacuum cleaners and blenders and radios and TVs and washing machines. And then we got um, the radar range. I think that showed up actually in the 40s. That was the first name for the microwave oven. We had military radar starting in the 30s. We've been electrifying everything for the last call it 150 years. Now we've got cell phones and w wireless technologies, um, Wi-Fi routers and tablets and iPads and everything, everything. <laughs> so as you speak, what I see are all these, what, what do we call them, radio waves or uh, coming at us from 100 directions, correct? Yes, and also coming from the devices. They're coming from the devices, and in order to operate, the devices need infrastructure, like cellular antennas, and those are ubiquitously deployed everywhere. <coughs> We're actually about to have an explosion of more stuff, m more infrastructure and more devices because of the Internet of Things. Um, in July of 2016, the FCC just passed the Spectrum Frontiers proceeding, and it will allow the FCC to rent a fuller part of the spectrum, which will allow for infrastructure that will support machine-to-machine -machine communication. So, for example, you can right now buy diapers that have a chip in them that will send a message to your smartphone saying that your baby's diaper needs changing. Everything will, anything that can be con connected in the cloud will be connected. What's the cloud? That's a really good question. And the people that I trust the most tell me no one knows. I like to say, and I can be partially wrong here, although I don't understand why, it's the space between your end use device and the data center, which stores the data that holds, for example, a video. Um, so you know you can download all kinds of software from the cloud. But with the Internet of Things, uh, our utilities, our transportation systems, all of that will be in the cloud. What does that say for surveillance? Anytime you go wireless, you risk interception. So that's a problem, and I'm not sure what we can do about it. In your book, and uh, uh, well, actually, I am sure you can go wired. Okay, All right. <laughs> that that would be good. <laughs> yeah. In your book, an electronic silent spring, facing the dangers and creating safe limits. And here, there's a picture of people living in a house, and right next door is a big, like cell phone tower. And the house has a smart meter on it. Okay. Uh, anyway, in the book, you explain that we now live in two worlds that both operate by electromagnetic energy, nature and digital technologies, two different worlds. But could you first explain what electromagnetic energy is? I'm not sure everybody really understands. Yeah, 
I'm, I'm st stunned because I don't think I can answer that question. <laughs> it's, got, um, it, um, it's kind of like asking, what is God? Give it a try. I'll give it a try. I like to go back billions of years when this planet was a mass of gases, water, rock, and dust. And the clouds, you know, were pushed by the wind and we had a buildup of charge. And then lightning began to strike. That's electromagnetic energy that's visible. And we actually had a bombardment of lightning storms. And out of that came the nucleic and amino acids that are the building blocks of life. So we got plants, you know, which made oxygen, which paved the way for animals. And mm, about a couple hundred thousand years ago, humans, as modern humans, showed up. And we had, I would say, at least two interests. One, we wanted to keep healthy. And so we made guidelines for keeping healthy. And then we also wanted to control electrical energy. We noticed what it could do. And about 200 years ago, humans became able to generate, store, and transmit electrical energy. And so n now we've got that man-made stuff that we talked about in the beginning of the conversation. That's man-made electro, um, electro, those things operate with man-made electromagnetic energy. And then the other world is what has been evolving through nature and what we absolutely depend on. Every cell in our bodies functions by electrochemical signals. Okay, Ed. You and many others have been working against smart meters here in Maine, the meters that are going on to our house that also use electromagnetic energy to communicate with towers and send signals and everything else. So could you put a local perspective on this? Uh, and also, what made you get into this uh, issue? You've been working with animals and fish and, you know, on that side of the environmental <coughs> world for a long time, and now it seems like you've gone in the opposite direction. Not that you've stopped doing those other things, but that you're working on this high-tech electrical stuff as well. Uh, what's the connection for you? And also, before you get into that answer, Give us your interpretation of what electromagnetic energy really is. Well, I think, Bruce, it's um, the electromagnetic energy is, is a force, right? This, and it comes from the sun. It comes from a variety of things. For the, pers from the, for the perspective or point of view of what we're talking about, we're talking about different uh, frequencies, which is generally how this is characterized. And if you imagine... Waves like the waves at an ocean, waves of electromagnetic energy coming by. Um, how often does this cycle, one, one up and down, go by a certain point, cycle per second? The higher the frequency, the more cycles are crammed into a given spot. The lower the frequency, the more gradual those waves are, like a swell out in the ocean. So from my sort of dummy point of view, I like to think of, uh, in terms of defining a key characteristic here, very gradual wave is more streamlined, goes further, it penetrates more, lower frequency whales, elephants communicate at very, very low frequencies. Our bodies uh, react to low frequencies. Um, they penetrate, they go a long ways. A high frequency, you can cram a lot of data into those undulations. There's a lot of power in there, a lot of punch, but they don't go very far. So in order, and, we'll, and Katie, I think we'll get into this, in order to make that happen, to convey all of those data, we're talking about a lot of increased data needs now, whether it's smart diapers or refrigerators or smart meters, okay? We're now collecting 24 seven data with smart meters from everybody you know, who has a meter. Um, that requires um, a very high frequency and that has certain characteristics that we'll, we'll get into. But I got into this because of the smart meter issue. Um, I was not that aware of a lot of this uh, before. And I like to say there's so many problems with smart meters, there's something for everybody to hate. And there's, there's the hackability issue, there's cybersecurity issues there. So there's privacy issues, there's constitutional issues, there's takings issues. 
the utility is putting a transceiver, a transmitter and a receiver onto your home, your data, Bruce, is coming to my house, going on through my smart meter to Katie's house and on down the line before it finally gets bumped back to the utility. Now, then there's the health aspects of this. Uh, as Katie mentioned, we've had a you know, billion years to, uh, of solar radiation and light life interacting here in Maine, but as humans, we've been here a couple hundred thousand years, um, more than that, smart meter radiation, cell phone radiation, been here for a hundred, couple hundred years, you know, so we've not had the time to adjust to that. And so we don't react very well, and some people react far more quickly than others in, in very negative ways. And there are very reliable estimates that by 2000 and gosh, it was either 17 or 20, it's coming right up. 50% of the world's population will have some visibly um, electrical sensitive part. As it relates to wildlife, um, a lot of our wildlife has magnetite in the brains, respond to uh, electromagnetic frequencies in a variety of ways, migratory species, Mary Meeting Bay, second most uh, popular waterfowl staging area in the northeast after Chesapeake, critically important bird area. So wildlife is affected in a huge way, as are plants, by this. And so that's the tie-in between Friends of Marimini Bay and what might seem like a totally separate issue. Katie, what little I know about all this is our bodies are mostly water, correct? You know, as, as humans. And when you have these electromagnetic radiation waves coming at us, is it true that it heats up our body essentially and that causes problems? Okay, so in 1934, Congress formed the FCC and it said, go ahead and make as many electronic, market as much electronics as you want as long as they don't, I'm getting to your water question yeah, by the okay. way, as long as, as long as those devices don't create harmful interference. Harmful interference is anything that interferes with existing radio or TV broadcasts and now cellular or internet services. That definition, the definition of harmful interference from the FCC has never included biological harm. They did do a test in the mid-90s of how, wh whether or not a cell phone is safe, and here's how they did it. They took a 220-pound plastic dummy and they filled his head with plastic fluid, so with um, salty fluid, and then they took his temperature. And they gave him a cell phone for six minutes. And because his temperature did not change by two degrees Celsius in those six minutes, you can have a cell, cell phone. That's it, that's the whole test. That's an immediate thermal test of whether this stuff is harmful or not. We have thousands of studies that show non-thermal effects. But a lot of people, as your question suggests, have the idea that because we have no immediate tissue heating, we're okay. There are, in fact, many other effects, though. So, Can you maybe? Yeah, let me tell you some of those. Um, um, well, in May of 2016, the National Toxicology Program released a $25 million rodent study showing definitive brain and heart tumors and DNA damage at 2G cell phone radiation. Um, and this is whole body exposure. The rats didn't have their phone up to their ear. But it was so, equal to, yeah. to having yeah. a, a cell phone to your ear. And, but what um, Ed is talking about is that there is whole body exposure, for example, from cellular antennas from Wi-Fi routers from smart meters, and then near body exposure from putting devices to your head, in your breast pocket, in your pants pocket. God forbid if you're a pregnant woman carrying a cell phone, then the baby's going to be getting something from the cell phone as well. Uh, I've seen women put, you know, in the cell bras, phones yeah. in the bra, and... They're showing increases in breast cancer. Yeah. And, and men who carry cell phones in their pockets, we, we have lots of studies showing sperm damage. Really? And, and on the way down, you described, the, was it Guatemala? What, 
What, what, what well, is there? well, yeah. people because people don't know that there's a problem, and um, that's actually um, I can talk about how that's relevant legally. Um, it's where you saw the phones attached. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, so in Berkeley, um, there's a, an ordinance where the industry at the point of sale is required to say what the manual says, which is don't keep this thing closer than, I think it's like seven-eighths of an inch from your head or something like that. And it's similar to the warning labels we have on cigarette packs. There was just a story in Newsweek about this. Yes, but the industry finds that this is a free speech issue. They don't want to do it. And so that's in why we're in other words, they, they don't want there to be any warnings. On, at the point of sale. They, yeah. they have the warning in the manual that nobody reads. It's in very small print. Yeah. What about other countries? Let's talk about that for a moment. I heard, if I, if I got this right, that France is pulling Wi-Fi out of, you said, libraries and preschools because they're concerned about the effects of this electromagnetic radiation on little girls' eggs. Is that true? Can I answer that? Yeah, sure. So children have smaller uh, heads and thinner skulls than adults. And going back to your water question, when they absorb radiation, it's more intense than when an adult does. So one of the most significant papers for me was written by Om Gandhi. He's a professor of electrical engineering at the University of Utah. And I think the title of the paper, which was published in IEEE Spectrum, is, yes, the children have uh, the, the children absorb more 